Honestly, I never thought I would be a professional one day. I, I was good in school, but I wasn't the type of person who would spend all the days working, studying really hard. I really enjoyed sport and music when I was in high school. And I went to college, I studied what that, it was interesting to me. I, a couple of years I studied materials engineering, then I took uh, the first lecture on dynamics, I'm like enough with the math, I changed major, I went to chemical really? engineering, okay. it was the only major without dynamics, okay. so I chose ch chemical engineering out of practicality, okay. and uh, I enjoyed it very much, and then uh, I ended up uh, doing a year abroad, I met a professor who offered me to go to graduate school, and eventually I became a professor, but honestly, I just, I just wanted to get a job. <laughs> I was the first person to go to high school in my family, so I didn't really have anybody to, to mentor me or to give me some sort of like, a, uh, I, I couldn't identify myself in a relative, I says, oh, I can do that profession one day. So I was a little lost. And honestly, I, I'm very proud to say that I participate in the activities to promote first generation visibility in our campus because I want the students to realize that a lot of professors are first generation students and they had no idea what they were doing. Guilty as charged. <laughs> so, at luck of the draw, I met the right mentors, and good people really helped me make my decision. But uh, I was very interested in learning, and a professor was studying bubbles, and I was fascinated by them, and I made them my career, <laughs> studying bubbles. Yes. So that's why a lot of people call me Dr. Bubble. Dr. Bubble. I like that. Maybe this is you have to. Okay, so you were not even thinking about the professor, but what I'm inspiring to be the first one in your family that is coming to this level of uh, study. So I'm sure that you are inspiring other uh, young generation in your family. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of my younger cousins now, he went to graduate school and he got his PhD a few months ago. Yeah, yeah awesome. he, he was a child when I was in college. We were a very big, uh, you know, age gap. But yeah. okay. So if, if we go back to a, a little bit uh, towards your childhood, uh, I think it maybe it was a little bit tough, it was smooth. How, how was your childhood? Well, it was, uh, it was very different than it will be today, you know. Childhood in the 80s was not uh, digital. Yeah. You would play soccer in the street. Uh, we would call it football in Italy, but we would play football in the street. It was a very normal thing in, in, in your country. And um, I, I was a very disobedient kid. If they told me there was a rule, I would break it. And we would <laughs> always get in trouble at school, at home. I was not obedient at all. And later on, I realized that disobedience is actually the root of investigation and research. Don't take anything for granted. Okay, yeah. But uh, it, it took me a while to realize the value of it. I thought it was a uh, detriment. But uh, yeah, I, I enjoy very much playing football when I was a kid. And I liked Legos and everything that dealt with, you know, some constructing gizmos and disassembling things and often not putting them back together. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised that is someone coming from Italy uh, is not playing football because in Italy everybody's playing football oh, there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, why? Well, it was like everybody, 100% of my friends, we all play football. So how was the decision of um, making the graduate study that you said that a professor just rooted you? Or, uh... Well, I, I owe very much the credit of all of that. I, it's all to, to my extension. He's a professor from UCLA, he still works there and he was my advisor. I was doing a year abroad, and, um, and he said, why don't you come back next year to do the dissertation for your Italian degree? And I said, well, I need to go back and talk to my Italian advisor and see if he allows me. And he said, well, um, if there is any resistance, I'll talk to him. So I went back and I talked to the professor, and he said, yeah, I don't have the time advising you, you go abroad, I don't know what you're gonna be doing there, and then I don't have much bandwidth to take on new students. So I talked again to the professor Stenson at UCLA, I called him, and he said, okay, well, in November I need to go to Europe for work. Can you set up an appointment with this professor? And he showed up in person. He oh, went to visit no him in way. person, and he explained to him what I would be doing you know, in, uh, under his supervision. And the Italian professor was like, please go and come back with the dissertation <laughs> done. He was thrilled because of course, the ambience in the field of aeration was gonna be my supervisor. And I went there and he arranged for me to have an internship at a large treatment plant. So I actually had the experience to work in a utility when I was there. And I did the dissertation for the Italian degree. I went to my first WEFTEC when I was still a student without any qualification and with the research I did with them. And it was, uh, it was overwhelming. It's like, you know, drinking from a fire hose. Well, it's yes. huge. Oh my God. All the top <laughs> people in the field, you write <laughs> our books. I get to meet them in the hallway. And then uh, at the end of that experience, he said, you want to come back for graduate school? You know, then maybe one day you can be a professor. And I said, well, 
if I look for a job in Italy, I don't think I'll make as much as a graduate student, at least. Yes. This is an offer that is three years long, so let's, let's take these three years, get more education, have more options. I ended up loving doing research. I really did. I did the research on aeration for three years. I loved it. I couldn't have enough of it. And three years later, I finished and I did a postdoc and looked for a job and here I am. There you go. So I think that that's very, very sensitive that a professor go extra miles when he or she see a potential students and do that thing. So I think now it's like, I think that your relationship with him is still going until now. We're very close. As a matter of fact, he's supposed to be here at the conference. Okay. And he has back pain, he had to cancel at the last minute. So yeah. oh, he told me, so I don't go around looking for him. Okay. Yeah, but uh, the, the thing I should do for the rest of my career is to pay forward what he taught me. Pay yes. forward by teaching it to other people, sharing with other people. Because I was, I was so lucky and it will be a pity and it will be awfully arrogant of me to keep it for myself. I need to pay it forward. So if you get that chance to say something to him, what do you want to say to him? Well, thank you for inspiring me to be generous with my time, with my students, you know, to always go the extra mile, to try to be as patient as possible. I'm very impatient by nature. <laughs> Those who know me well, they know that. But uh, I try to do an extra effort, to put an extra effort with the students because uh, everyone learns differently. And uh, I learned from him, it's my professor in Italy wore a suit to class. My professor at UCLA would roll up his leaves and take the tools from the toolbox and help me fix an experiment. By so, himself? Yes. So it's a, a, something that it was a very different approach to engineering, yes. to be a professor. And uh, I enjoyed it very much. I like, you know, tinkering with tools and uh, going to the field. You know, in the field, there's always a plan B. And so you can really control a treatment plant. It's not like a lab experiment. And you always have to, to improvise. That's, uh, that's really a, my passion. I, I made a career as a field experimentalist. Okay, that's, that's amazing. Aside from your, your supervisor, definitely during your graduate study or the undergraduate study, you have some professors or instructors that inspired you or have a positive impact in your life or have something that you remember them. Do you remember any of those? Very much. Uh, you know, uh, there was another professor in the audio school who gave the clearest and best lectures I've ever seen in my life. His name was Keith Stoltzenbach. He retired. And uh, it was an inspiration to me. Like, how clear can you be teaching a concepts that are so complicated? Yes. I had a hard time understanding them until I took his class. He really made clear to me all those years of chemical engineering in, in 10 weeks. And it was an inspiration how clear it could be. And uh, I really look up to him, to his style of teaching. And, um, and um, you know, when I was in graduate school, I rented a room in a house with a family, and I, they ended up being my adoptive family. I lived with them for 10 years. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and um, the lady of the house was an artist. Right now, she passed, but she's one of the great artists of our time. Her, her artwork is in the great museums of the world. And she was very disobedient. She's the one who taught me, you should always be disobedient. Because art is about being disobedient. Otherwise, you just repeat the same thing over and over. Because you were always... <laughs> and I was very disobedient. I realized, wow, I feel very validated now. And I realized that scientific research is just like art. That's why you say state of the art. They're one and the same. And uh, you want to do something that nobody has done before. And so you need to break with the, you know, the preconcepts and you need to break from the pack. They always believe because somebody said so. And, uh, and I applied that in graduate school in, to my dissertation, namely. And uh, it, was a, it was a great experience and I, yeah, she was very influential to me. Very influential to me. Her name is Chana Horowitz. Okay, it so was Chana just, Horowitz. Yeah, we we say thank you to her as well for supporting you during that time because we we know that moving from a culture to another culture. So once you moved from uh, Italy to uh, United States, this is a big move. To oh yes. Culture. So and I think there was some kind of challenge or shock. If you remember any of those shocks at the beginning when you. Oh yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, very, very much. <laughs> what was the, the biggest, um, you know, I would say obstacle or shock that you got once you um, get merged on that uh, new culture? Well, in our culture, food is very central to our life. I agree. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, the first time somebody brought me to an Italian restaurant to impress me, it was a heartbreaking experience. <laughs> I thought I was in one of those uh, dystopic movies after, you know, that a civilization is extinct and we try to reconstruct it from fragments. And uh, it was, um, it was, um, 
it was shocking. So I started cooking at home, yeah. pasta oh, for really? my friends, and everybody always wanted to have it because it tasted like pasta, not like something this topic, yeah. But the food, I would say, it was a, a, a main thing. And the other thing is I lived in Los Angeles, and I, I grew up in a, in a society where you don't need a car. And in LA, without a car, it's like missing a major organ. <laughs> you must have it. And so the fact that you have to, if you want to live without a car, it's very difficult. It's possible, but you have to work on it very actively. And so that's something that uh, it was a cultural shock for me. Does any one of your friends uh, told you that you should open a restaurant there once you start to cook for them? Why not? <laughs> I think I can do much better for myself as a professor <laughs> than as a cook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I understand that um, even during our graduate study, we have a lot of uh, great memories and some uh, hard time. Um, uh, and maybe students look at us now, our professors now, but they didn't know that we already went through some tough time. If you remember any of those hard times and good memories, do you have something just click in your mind? Oh, absolutely. One thing I relate very much with is international students' life. Because I was a student, I had a visa. And in order to stay in the country, I need to maintain my grades, I need to pass my exams. And at the end of the visa, at that time, there is a, it was an option to seek employment. But you need to find employment within a very small window of time. If you don't get offered the job, you need to leave the country. So it was like a do or die situation. Right now, that, that system is a little bit longer. But I understand the pressure of being an international student thinking, I'm going to graduate this year, what am I going to do next year? If I don't get a job, I need to leave the country. I have a life here, I have a partner, a, an adopted family, my friends are here, and where am I going to go? And so it's a, if after a, a while you live elsewhere, when you go back to where you're from, you feel like a visitor to some extent. Yeah. Because you're not 100% from there anymore. And you're not 100% from the new place either. You just moved there recently. And, uh, you know, I lived most of my life in California, and I cannot tell you that I'm 100% from California either. You'll always be in between. But uh, now I have the luxury of being able to stay in a place, I have employment, I have paperwork to stay for immigration. And at that time, I did it. It was all contingent upon school and the next job. So I took my sleep for many months until I, find, I found a job that allowed me to, you know, stay in the country. Okay, that, that's very tough. <clears throat> no, and, and stressful time, and this is how to Very stressful. deal with that stress. What about the, the, the good moment that you have during your graduate study? Well, I, I was very lucky because when I was um, in graduate school, you know, uh, most of the time, so at least for my career, all the time we do some research, we come up with a paper, we publish a paper, it could be in a good journal, an excellent journal, and we feel, we feel very satisfied. We moved our knowledge a little forward. But when I was in graduate school, I discovered a physical phenomenon that nobody knew before. And I felt like I was touching the sky with a finger. Yes. Because I discovered something that nobody before me knew. And now I know why people dedicate their life to investigation. Because the feeling of having discovered something. And that night, when I found out, and it was like 10 p.m., and I was the only one at school, and I started running around the hallway <laughs> screaming, and there was nobody around. To, really? to, to celebrate with, but I, I felt like, that it was a magical moment that I will never forget. Yes. And I discovered something that is completely inconsequential to most people's lives, but the fact that I was the first one, I realized it in that moment, yes. to me, meant the world. And it was the most meaningful moment in investigation of my whole career. And that happened when I was a graduate student. Wow, what a moment. I think it was, this is... A... <laughs> it was quite something. And I yeah. still study the topic of bubbles because it's, it, I was charmed by, <laughs> by that. <laughs> so now...